All of us have been victims of poor boundaries in our life, haven't we? I mean, where you just cross the line because that boundary, you, you allowed it to move and shift, and you cross the line, and you just found out, and it just hurt you. It cost you, didn't it? And so um, we, we've kind of talked a little bit about boundaries, about this idea that a boundary is the space between our current reality and our maximum limit. So we know that there's a maximum limit. We know that there's an edge that, that we can walk up to before we fall over, but it's dangerously close. And so what we want to do is instead of getting right to the edge of everything in our life and going right to the maximum limit of that, we want to back that boundary up just a little bit. And uh, so there's some safety there, okay? And so, um, so when we talk about this, we're talk, we've talked about, you know, our time and all kinds of different things like that so far the last couple of weeks. Um, but uh, when we talk about this, we're really talking about the idea that we have some, some room to just kind of relax, where we're not under the pressure of living at this maximum limit all the time. And so what we've been learning is that all of us do have limits, and God knows, God of all, of all of us, He knows that we could live at our maximum limit, but He has invited us to step back from that a little bit and uh, to establish some healthy boundaries in our life. And so today, we're going to actually talk about another cultural problem that, that, that affects and impacts probably, I'm going to say statistically speaking, statistically speaking, that it affects most people in this room, okay? When I say most, that's what I mean is most, okay? And uh, so because what we're going to talk about today is the subject of money. How many of you like money? Okay, about three of you are honest. The rest of you, I know you're not being honest. I like money, okay? How many others just be honest and say, yeah, I like money? Yeah, I didn't ask if you loved money. That's That's the... That's the root of all evil, okay? But, but I like to have money. I like to have extra money. But how many of you know that when we think about Americans as a whole, there's some interesting statistics that I got out of USA, USA Today in November of 23, and, and they declared this, that in 2023, American credit card debt totaled $1.3 trillion dollars. I mean, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of indebtedness to, to a credit card company. Okay, check this out. Total, total consumer debt in Americans, meaning it's not just credit cards, but it could, but it's anything of depreciable value, value that you, that you owe money on, okay, like your, like your car, lease payment, okay, uh, whatever, okay. Total consumer debt balances right now in America at the end of 2023 is $17 trillion dollars. I mean, that's a lot of money. Imagine what we could do with $17 trillion in this country. I mean, it'd wipe out a good chunk of our presidential's, the last couple of presidents' debts, right? Okay, just a thought. Okay. Um, check this out. The average household, according to USA Today, the average household, okay, which, which includes you, includes me, okay, that our consumable debt on an average, is $101,915. So when we talk about this, how many of you would recognize with me today that our American culture, that, that we have a money management problem? Come on, raise your hands if you agree with that. Okay. So today we're going to talk about how you can begin to set some boundaries in your financials according to what God has said in Scripture. Is that okay? Okay, so here's a couple things that I just want to share with you. I just want to share you four, real quick, four quick facts to kind of put us all on the same page today about money. And here's the first thing that I want you to understand. Is it, I think that you and I could all agree that we, that we all need money to survive. Hello? I mean, in our culture, we, we don't live in the 1700s anymore. Right? Okay? In our culture, we all need money to survive. I mean, even if you are considered what, what, what financial gurus would consider to be debt-free, and, and you own your house outright, and you have no other consumable debt, you still need money. 
You still need money to, to buy groceries. You still need money to pay your utilities. You need money for your, uh, your property taxes, your fuel, your insurance. I mean, you just got to pay, right? So even if you have no consumable debt, <clears throat> you still need cash. You still need money. And it's a very important part of our lives in today's culture, okay? In fact, very few people in our society, I would, I would bet, would know how to survive if we had a major financial collapse in our economy. Because most of you, you don't hunt, most of you don't fish, most of you don't know how to build a campfire. Okay, your idea of hitting a campfire is walking over to the thermostat and going click, okay, right? I mean, that's your campfire, okay? Um, and so, and so to, to be able to survive with that cash, okay, the reality of it is, is that we all need money to survive. Here's the fact number two that I think is common to all of us is that we all live on a percentage of our income. Hello? Now, I want you to think about this because, unfortunately, <clears throat> most of you don't know what that percentage is. Now, when I say most of you, that's what I mean is most of you. You don't know what that percentage is, okay? So, so, so some of you in this room today, and some of you that are watching online, you, you might contribute 3 to 5% to your retirement, and, uh, and then you spend the rest of it, which means that you, that you live on, uh, you know, 98 to 97, 90, 96% of your income, okay? And, and, and that's your business, okay? Uh, others, others of you, you've chosen that that you want to be a part of God's economy, and so you've chosen that right off the top, that 10% of your income goes to God, and as a result of that, um, you, 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 you live on about, um, on about 85 or 90%, because then you kick in a couple of percent to your retirement, okay, and so you, that's where you live. Other people in this room, okay, and, and I don't know who you are, okay, so I'm just making some general assumptions, because it, this is most, right? is that most of you live on about 100% of your income, okay? Meaning that what comes in goes out. As long as you're just managing the payments, you're good. And so, so if you get a raise, all that means is that you get more to spend, okay? And, 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 and so you just live at 100%. Now, <clears throat> the problem with America is, okay, is that believe it or not, most Americans live on let's just throw a number out there, at about 120% of their income. To which you're thinking to yourself, well, how is that even possible? Well, it's because they have credit cards, they have leases, they have car payments, um, they just have all kind of payments, they're managing, 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 and they don't even realize how much percentages that, that they live on because they're just able to manage these minimum payments that are required. Okay, and so every month <clears throat> that that sucker doesn't get paid off, okay, <clears throat> you get deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. But you just keep borrowing and you just keep using and you keep borrowing and getting more credit cards because as long as you can manage the payments, everything's going to be okay. And so the majority of Americans live at that over 100% uh, or, or higher. And so no matter what the percentage is, the reality of it is, is that every one of us in this room, we live on a percentage of our income. And today, I want you to consider about trying to figure out what that percentage is, okay? I want you to determine by the end of the week what that percentage is. Here, here's the third fact about money that I think applies to all of us as well, is that everyone believes that if we had more money, that there would be less financial pressure. True. I mean, and so what happens is, is that, I mean, and, and, and you've probably said this in your lifetime before, man, if I just made just, just a dollar more an hour, all of my bills could get paid. If I just made a dollar more an hour, or, or, or when it comes to buying things, here's, here's how it works. Uh, when, you, when you buy things, is you think, oh, man, if, if I just could spend just another hundred bucks, if I just spent another hundred dollars more, I could get a bigger TV. Okay, or or if, if I could just spend another $500 more, I'll get leather instead of cloth. Okay, or, or, or if I spend another $1,000 more, 
that gets me into the deluxe model, okay? Or if I spend another $10,000 more, then, then I really land with the house of my dreams and I really get the house that I've always wanted. And so here's the thing, is that no matter what it is, when it comes to spending money, we just have this mindset that if we had more money, that, that it just leads to less financial stress and less financial pressure. But that, that clearly is not true. And the reason why we know that is because of fact number four. And here's this, is that most people make more money today. You make more money right now than you ever have before, and yet you still have debt and a tremendous amount of financial pressure. True? I mean, that's American way. And so this, is just, this just raises such an interesting question because I think the question becomes for us is do we have an income problem or do we have a spending problem? See, it's one or the other. See, and what we're going to discover today is that financial pressure, that, that stress that you feel when it comes to managing your money, it actually has nothing to do with the amount of money that you make. Instead, it has everything to do with where your financial boundary is when it comes to managing your money. In other words, financial pressure comes from not having enough space between where you're living right now and your maximum limit. And the reality of it is, is that most Americans live at the absolute maximum limit and they're actually falling off the edge and they're halfway down the mountain. So, in Malachi chapter 3, <clears throat> what we're going to discover <clears throat> is that uh, th th this, is, this is just an amazing little book. It's, it's just a few chapters long. Okay, you can read it in about 15 minutes. And what you're going to discover is that Malachi was written 400 years before Jesus came, but it was written about 100 years after the Israelites had been exiled uh, from Babylon. Okay, And so uh, they were released from captivity, and Malachi comes along. And during this window of, of history, during the Israelites, the, the, the Jews had become very complacent <clears throat> about their relationship with God. And what had happened is, is that they were just living life to the absolute maximum limit on most areas of their life. And, 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 and that, that maximum limit just kind of began to push God out of their lives. And so what happened is, is that they began to realize that their crops were failing. And uh, there were rumors that they were going to be invaded again. And suddenly their lives... <clears throat> just kind of seemed to go from bad to worse to worse to worse. And so Israel begins asking a question that perhaps you have asked before, and they begin asking, God, where are you? Hey, God, why are things so difficult for me? Why are things so difficult for us as a people? Why is this happening to me? Now, how many of you have ever asked God that before? Come on, raise your hands. Because I have. And so, so, so here's the thing. God chooses to speak through this guy by the name of Malachi. Uh, some people call him Malachi, the Italian prophet. I don't know. I don't know about that. But uh, we'll go with Malachi, okay? And so, uh, so, so, so Malachi, God speaks to Malachi, the prophet of the day, and, 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 he, and he communicates to the people an important message about their money. Okay, and here's what he says. He says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, he reminds the people, he says, hey, I just want you to know that I am the Lord and I what? Come on, say that with me. I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Now, what God is saying here is that God never moved. What God is really saying is that God is the same. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, right now, forever. God does not move. He has established his word. Everything that he said is true back then as it is right now as it will be in the future. 
So that's what God is saying. He's saying, I'm the Lord. I don't change. Which, which raises an interesting question because if something isn't happening in our relationship with God, who is it then that's changing? Okay. All right, so, so we all on the same page? Okay, so this is such a great question. <clears throat> okay, and so God, God says <clears throat> he never moved. Instead, it was the people then that have turned away and they have begun to move the boundaries in their life away from God. To which the people, they turn around and they ask God a question, okay? <clears throat> and, and, and here's, and, or excuse me, God goes on and here's what he says. He says, ever since the days of your ancestors, you have, what's the word he uses? Okay, y'all understand what that means? Despise. Like, eh, okay, you told me this, I'm not, do, I'm not doing that. Okay, that's kind of like what Texas is doing to the feds right now. If you're following the news, okay? They're scorned at what the government's doing about the border, okay? So, so that's what God's saying. Is ever since the days of your ancestors, you've scorned my decrees, you have failed to obey them. Now return to me, because God never moves, return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. In other words, God never moved. Instead, it was the people who moved. It was the people that redirected, moved the boundary. Okay, to which the people now, they ask a question. And they says, well, God, <clears throat> how can we return to you when we have never gone away? In other words, the people, they honestly believed that they were doing everything right. They didn't see the error of their ways. The problem was is that they had kind of become complacent. They'd kind of let their guard down a little bit. They started moving the boundaries that God had told them to establish clear back to the days of their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, so they just kept moving them closer and closer and closer to their maximum limit. And before long, they didn't even realize how much danger they were in. And so God, what he does is he spins this around and God asks the people a question with another question. And here's what God says. He says, should people cheat God? <clears throat> Yet, you've cheated me. But you ask, well, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? Well, God says, since you asked... You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. And as a result of that, you are under a, what's the word? A curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Now, here, here's what you need to understand, okay? Now, <clears throat> this scripture specifically is talking about a law that was established clear back in Moses' day, all right? <clears throat> Now, if you were an Israelite, okay, if you were a Jew, God had told them that for every, every dollar that they had earned, that they were supposed to take 20 cents right off the top and give that back to them. Okay, you tracking me? So how much is that percentage for those of you that are good at math? Okay, 20%, which means that they were allowed to live on how much? 80%, okay? How many, how many of you just got really good at math? Okay? Some of you weren't sure. You were, okay, so, so here's how that worked. Okay? <clears throat> Is that it was actually the law for a Jew <clears throat> that they could only live on 80% of their income. The first 10% was supposed to be given to the local church. Okay? Or, or in their case, the temple, okay? The synagogue. And it was designed to, to go towards building maintenance, uh, the priests, um, all the expenses that, that incurred there at, at, the, at the temple. And so the 10% of everybody's income was supposed to go to that. Okay, the other 10% was also supposed to be given to God to fund the different feasts and the different uh, festivities that they were had throughout the year. But here's the interesting thing, is that every third year that they, in their calendar years, every third year, the 10% that was supposed to go towards the various feasts were actually, every third year, supposed to go to help the poor. So, if you were a law-abiding Jew, okay, if you were the Israelites and you were obeying God's word and you weren't scorning his word, but you, in fact, were obeying that, then you lived 20% of your income 
just went to God and his work before you paid or did anything else with the other 80%. So here's what happened, is that over time, okay, this didn't happen just right away, but it happened gradually, people begin to think, well, man, 20%, that, that's, that's a lot of money to give to God. God doesn't need that much money. God certainly doesn't need my measly 20%. And so they begin to move the boundary. And so they begin to give less and less and less. And some eventually got to the point where they were spending everything. And if they had a little bit of jingle left over and it was time to give, then they would throw that in the offering bucket as it came by. And they were giving God the leftovers. Okay. And so what happened is, is that eventually their crops begin to fail their health was in decline. Things came up that just seemed to just devour people's time and their money and their health, all because God had withdrawn his blessing from their lives and people just couldn't figure out what was going wrong. And so Malachi comes out and... <clears throat> And he basically says these words. Now, now, these are my words. These aren't Malachi's words, okay? But as it relates to the conversation, basically what Malachi told the people is he says, look, he says, you guys, you move the boundary beyond a healthy, beyond a healthy way. You guys move that boundary away from health. And so as a result of that, God himself began to just not be involved in Israel's money problems anymore. Financially, the people were cursed. In essence, God just says, hey, <clears throat> you want to do this without me? Go on ahead. Good luck. See ya. Go ahead and do it your way. And as long as they didn't obey, that curse continued to just rest upon their lives. Now, what's interesting about this story that we're reading here today and this is what I just love about God's word is that, you know, it just seems so harsh sometimes. You're thinking 20%, 10%, good grief. But here's the deal is that God, he doesn't chastise his children without giving them a chance to move the boundary back to health. God always gives us some mercy and he grants grace for us to be able to reestablish the boundary in our life. Okay, back to where it belongs. And so what God does is he goes on and he says this. He says this in verse, uh, verse 10. <clears throat> he says, so here's what I want you to do, people, children of Israel. I want you to bring all the what? Tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. <clears throat> if you do this, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open what? For who? You. And then he says this, he says, I will pour out a blessing that is so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Now, let me explain to you what a tithe is, because that's kind of an Old Testament word. Okay, we, we say that here, okay, but, um, but, but a lot of people don't really know what that is, so let me, let me, let me explain. A tithe in the Old Testament law was a payment of, ten, of a tenth. Okay, so whatever you made, a tenth was something that you paid to God. Now, I want you to hear that language. Because a tithe is not something that you give to God. It's something that you pay to God. You hearing me? That was Old Testament. Okay, and so here's the thing, <clears throat> is that for some of you, right now, your hackles, they just went all up, and you're like, oh, Pastor Brian, man, this is my first Sunday here, and I can't believe you're talking about money. And some of you, you're just like, ah, really? Do you have to talk about that? Well, listen, <clears throat> it's not me who talked about it, okay? It, it, it's God who, who said this, okay? And so, so here's the thing, <clears throat> is that... <clears throat> This message really isn't about tithing and about you getting, getting money to the church. Okay, that's not what the, the intention of this is all about. Okay, so some of you are actually thinking, well, Pastor Brian, that's Old Testament. I live in New Testament. 
<laughs> well, let me help you with that just a minute because, um, because the New Testament, actually, did you know, you, you probably didn't know because that's why you're arguing this case, okay, is that uh, <clears throat> there's actually a bunch of references. In fact, Jesus himself, Jesus, talks about tithing and he validated this principle of tithing that you pay the tenth. Okay, so we can go Old Testament, New Testament, it doesn't matter. Tithing is a New Testament principle. It's a modern day principle that is still in effect for the church because Jesus validated that, okay? And you can just take a picture of that. Okay, then also if you come to the book of Hebrews, the author, whoever wrote Hebrews, we don't actually know who wrote Hebrews, they talked a lot about tithing. Okay, in chapter 7. And you can just read that sometime on your own. Okay, so, so here's the thing. Is that before you get mad at me and you quit listening and you start thinking, well, man, this, this topic, okay, I don't know, Pastor Rick, okay, listen, all we're talking about is setting some healthy boundaries. That's all we're talking about. Okay, now, one of those boundaries that God has established was that you shall not live on 100% of your income. That's the boundary. Okay? And so if you are, I want to help you get past that. I want to help you correct that, bring some health into that. Because what we're asking here and what we're really talking about is an element of trusting God with our money. Isn't it? Because God knows that you could live at the maximum limit. He knows that you could manage all those payments and go beyond your maximum limit. He knows that you could work six day, uh, seven days a week. He knows that you could cram more into your schedule so that you could work a little bit more hours to earn more money. He knows that you could spend more money. Okay? He knows that you could afford bigger payments. <clears throat> but God also knows that that mentality is where the danger zone is. And, and, and in the danger zone, there's, there's less peace, there's, there's, there's more complications, okay? There's more worry, there's way less joy in your life, um, there's way more stress in your life, and quite frankly, you just have a lot more to lose. Okay, there's a phone that going off, okay, okay, all right. So, what God does is God actually gives us an alternative to living our financial lives to the maximum and, and, and help us create a healthy boundary by inviting him to help us with our money. Okay, so here's what God said, and then I'm going to give you a little illustration. God says here, here's the thing. If you do this, If you do this, it, 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 okay, it, listen to me, hear my heart. This is totally your decision. It's not mine. Even God gives you the option to do this or not. You with me? God says, if you do this, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Just try it, God says. I didn't put that in there. Okay, I didn't write that in there. That's what God says. God says, try it. Put me to the, what's the word? Test. Okay, <clears throat> now, um, today, <clears throat> um, we're going to have a little illustration here. And I've actually prearranged a, a volunteer today. So, Lyric, would you come up here with me? <clears throat> okay. So here's what we're going to do is, um, <clears throat> Lyric is one of our amazing young people at the church. <clears throat> Everybody say, hi, Lyric. <clears throat> now, Lyric, you're going to help me illustrate this. Can you handle that today? <clears throat> okay, um, you got deep, hey, you got, you got big pockets. That's important for this illustration. Okay, now, here's the deal. <clears throat> we're going to pretend that you're an Israelite, you're a Jew, and that I, this is dangerous, okay? I'm going to play the role, I'm going to play God's role, 
and I'm going to be the one who provides for you, okay? <clears throat> and so there's a couple of rules, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is going to represent God's church, okay? So here's the deal. I got to find out where the middle is. There's so much of it here right now. Okay. All right. Okay. Everybody on camera, you can see that. Okay. <clears throat> what we have here is hundred penny bills. <clears throat> so here's a caveat. <clears throat> I'm going to provide for you, and for every ten that I give you, how much are you going to give me back? You remember the number? Yeah. Or or ten percent. Okay, now here's the caveat though, <clears throat> okay? I'll continue to give to you and provide for you if you pay that back to me. Is that a deal? Okay, so then that means that you can live on $9 and I live on one, okay? I receive one back. But here's the other caveat to that. <clears throat> if you fail to give me back one of the 10, here's the other part of that rule is that not only do you, are you going to pay me back 10%, but now you're going to pay me back an additional, which means that you're actually I'm going to charge you 20% interest. Is that fair? Okay, so we understand the rules. Okay, hold out your hands. We're going to see how this works. Now, now where does the money go? How much? Of every how much? Right, okay, just checking out. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, all right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hey, now, 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 here's a cool illustration here, okay? Now, I gave all that to you, and, and you couldn't even contain it all. Now, I just have a question for you. Would you rather live on that amount and have me bless you, or would you rather live on all of it and take the chance without my blessing? The first option. Smart answer. So guess what? <clears throat> because you answered that properly and your attitude's right, mm -hmm. guess what? I'm just going to give that to you. I'm just going to keep on blessing you. Okay? See how that works? Okay. Can you pick that up real quick? Okay. Let's give her a hand. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Here's what I want you to understand. Isn't it cool to see people just picking up God's blessings, even, even while God's doing other work? Okay. Now, here, here's what I want you to understand. <clears throat> what we've seen. Oh, that's yours. You get that. Was that, was that worth coming up and helping today? Okay, good. You need a bucket to hold it all in? Okay, you can hold that until you get it organized, okay? <clears throat> all right. Now, spit, now, lyrics learn how to play the guitar, so buy something for your guitar, buy a cool something, okay? Yeah, all right. Okay. <clears throat> now, now what, what, we've, what we've done here is we've just illustrated this opportunity to invite God 
to be a part of our financials. Are, are you tracking me? It's, it's, it's an invitation to say, God, you know, man, I, I've kind of screwed this up a little bit, and I'm not sure how all this works. And, and can I just be honest with you? I don't understand how it works. But what I am just declaring to you today is that it does work. And we personally are testaments of that. Okay? My kids are learning that principle now. It is, it is a testimony to their lives that God blesses. We can't understand it. We can't pencil it out. God just, just does it. And so here's the thing. It's an invitation to invite God to help us establish healthy boundaries. <clears throat> but check this out. When God... When we say yes to God, God gives us an additional promise in this next scripture. Because he says this. <clears throat> he says, if you do this, he says, your crops are going to be abundant. For I will, what's the words? I will guard those now. I'm going to guard them from insects and disease your grapes aren't going to fall from the vine before they're ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Okay, now one version describes this verse this way, is, is that instead of saying, I will guard them, the translation really is more about the idea that I will prevent the devourer from coming into your lives. You, you, you see how that works? When we participate with God's financial problem or pr uh, pr uh, program, he prevents the devourer from coming into our lives. Now, let me just ask you this question. When it comes to your financials, how many of you have ever felt in your financial status that you've just had a devourer come from time to time? Okay, I mean, how many of you have ever just felt like... like <clears throat> Just these unforeseen financial challenges arise. I mean, you, you wake up and you're on your way to work and you're late for time and you got a dead battery. Okay, or 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 you go to the doctor and it and and, and they, they end up just costing you way more than what you anticipated and the insurance didn't cover that much and you know you got you got higher electric bill and your groceries are just you get a lot less for your for your dollars and 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 they raise your rates of your insurance and. And, well, then your car died, and you called Dwayne up, and, you know, he's like, man, you, you're just going to have to ante up and get a new car. I can't help you. Okay? And, uh, and, and, and the fence blew over during a storm, and just these unforeseen things that come that, that you are responsible for, but suddenly you're just figuring out that something's just devouring that in my life. Because stuff catches you off guard. Listen, all of that is a devourer. That is a devourer in your life. Something just came in and it robbed you of production and it robbed your crops and it robbed your income because it was a curse. Okay, So God says, listen, the choice is yours because if you do this, right, the choice is yours. He says, but, but if you'll just move the boundary back, just move the boundary back, then I'll bless that. So as we wrap this up this morning, there's so much to unpack about this. In fact, this whole thing is like an entire, like, like about a, a one-year series, okay? <clears throat> but I'm not going to bore you with that, okay? Um, but what we're talking about here this morning is creating healthy financial boundaries. Because what all of us want is financial peace. What all of us want is to not have to worry about how much month there is versus your income that came in. What all of us want is for our bills to get paid and, not, and, and, and still have a little bit of jingle in our pocket left over, right? What all of us want is to be able to enjoy a vacation a couple times a year without putting that on credit card, okay? What all of us want is to be able to give when, when, when somebody has a need or, or we're triggered by something that just tugs at our heartstrings, we want to be able to give generously, but we can't afford it. To donate to that project and to know that if the economy collapses, 
that I don't have to worry because I don't live in this economy. I live in God's economy. You tracking with me? Because God's my provider. So, there's a ton of lessons, ton of application here. I've got to move on. Okay? I just want to give you just real quickly just two simple applications that you can take away from this. Okay? Just two, two takeaways. Okay? We're going to move through this quickly. Okay? Number one, the first thing is that when you're creating new financial boundaries, I just want to invite, invite you just to consider to invite God to participate with your financials. Just, just ask God to, to help you. And, and so what that means is, is that if you ask God to help you, he's already determined some steps that you need to take. Okay? And it starts, it starts, it starts with giving to him first. And here's the reason why. This isn't even in my notes, it's a freebie. Is because when I give to God first, before I pay my taxes, before I put into my retirement, before I buy groceries for my babies, when I give to God first, what I am declaring with that 10% is, God, I trust you. I trust you to provide for me. I am removing myself from this world's economy and I am submitting to your economy. You hearing me? This is is so important. So it begins with giving to God first. Now, some of you have never, ever, ever heard of the tithing principle, and you just are like, oh, 10%. Oh, I can't afford that. I have too much debt. Listen, that's okay. Nobody here is going to judge you about that. But here's what I want you to, here's what I want to challenge you with. <clears throat> is if you can't give 10%, I want to encourage you to choose a percentage and begin doing that diligently. Just choose a percentage. No matter what it is, maybe maybe you start out with 3% or 4%. You say, God, man, even even 3% is a stretch, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to test you in this. Help me. Help me to grow my faith and give 3% for a little while and see what God does. And then raise that percentage until you can get to that full 10%. Okay, now that's just an encur- just a thought, an encouragement. Okay, but begin and, and just be consistent in that. Whether you attend church, don't attend church, whether you attend this church or you choose to give to another church, just practice this. You're not given to me. Okay, you're not given to our church. You're given to God. Okay, you with me? Okay, <clears throat> because God, here's what He does: is God challenges you to test Him. And so here's the thing. <clears throat> If you begin to do this, and you just start today, you say, hey, Pastor Brian, I'm going to do this. You know, God, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to start with X amount of percent. Maybe it's 10%. Maybe it's a little less. I'm going to start. But God, I'm testing you. Here's the deal. It's God who challenges you to do that. And if he doesn't provide for you, then you're off the hook. But here's what I know. I know that God's going to make a provision for you. I know it because it's happened to me again and again and again and again. And yeah, things, things were tight. Things were tough. Things were challenging. I had to give up some things. Kimberly had to give up some things. There were seasons in our life where we had way too much debt. We had to get that taken care of. But we challenged God. And God never, ever, ever, ever let us down. Here's the second thing. Stop robbing yourself. I just want to encourage you, get out of debt. Pay off that car as fast as you can. Pay off your house as fast as you can. 
just cut up your credit cards. You don't need them. Okay, listen. I have been, in, okay, I wasn't going to go here, but I have been, uh, in my personal life, we, we, we do not do credit. Okay, we, we just don't do it. And I'm just telling you, I have traveled the world cash only. You don't need credit cards. I'm telling you that credit cards, I'm just telling you right now, credit cards is the biggest absolute lie of Satan in our economy and in your life than any other thing. He wants to trap you. And anytime you're trapped, that is not of God because God is all about freedom. God came to set you free. God came to give you life and life more abundantly. Woo. Okay, moving right along here. <clears throat> Okay, so, so you know how to get out of debt, okay? And take, a, take a Dave Ramsey class, okay? Get, just start paying off, okay? It, it, listen, if it took you 10 years to get, it, get into debt, it, it's going to take you some time to get out of debt. Okay, I'm just telling you. <clears throat> we, we teach the Dave Ramsey class here. We can get you in, signed up into that class. Do whatever you can, okay? There's tons of ways to do that. Okay, here's the thing. None of this is rocket science. <clears throat> but you just need to make a decision to stop robbing yourself and just begin to set some healthy boundaries in your life, okay? <clears throat> to create some space between your reality and your maximum limits. So as we wrap this up today, here's what I want you to do. So I want you to think about this question right here that I think is so important when it comes to setting uh, healthy financial boundaries, okay? And it's this question right here. I want you to just ask yourself, what do I need to change in my financial practices for God to stop the devourer in my life? What do I need to do? Now, now maybe, maybe it's pay off some debt. <clears throat> maybe it's just learning to be generous. You know, I mean, so, some of you, you, you give and you don't have debt, but you're just greedy. Ah, my little precious. Mine, mine. <laughs> well, listen, that's not scripture either. Generous, generous, generous. Maybe that's, maybe that's it, okay? Maybe it is that you need to become a percentage giver, okay? What do you need to do? What do you need to change in your financial practices for God to stop the devourer in your life, okay? And so whatever it is, God knows that you could live life financially to the limit. Some of you are doing that right now, and you are so sick and tired of it. I, I'm just telling you, I never knew how much pressure there was, how much stress there was managing the payments. I never knew it until all those payments were gone. I never knew it. And that's what I want for you. I want you to have peace. I want you to have life. I want you to have joy. I want you to have a healthy, a healthy boundary when it comes to your money management.